The last paranormal event I witnessed at the camp, and coincidentally, the last time I've been at said camp, took place about a week after the events I recounted in my last experience. Myself and about four other staffers were in the lower field, about 75 yards from the mouth of the river trail, enjoying a fire. We had snuck down to smoke cigarettes. While we were sitting there that night, the fireflies around the mouth of the trail were starting to flash red. At first, it seemed to be the whole forest in the direction of the river, filled with red flashes. It was somewhat unnerving given that I had seen the week before, but I myself had witnessed these lightning bugs doing this long before I believed in the paranormal. I smoked another cigarette and joked, talked and cracked wise ones about our boss, and just the people we worked with in general. It was just 15 and 16 year olds doing their thing, lost in conversation for 10 minutes or so. We all failed to notice our friend, who we'll call Kay, standing away from the circle, facing the river trail. I saw her out of the corner of my eye, but just figured she was taken aback by the fireflies, that she had never seen them or something. About 30 seconds later, I glanced at her and saw her still standing there. I walked over to check on her and noticed her head was tilted slightly upward, looking up toward Antenna Pine. It's a large pine tree that sits atop a ridge three and a half miles from the camp, across the river. When standing nearly anywhere with an unobstructed view, you can see the pine from camp. I followed her gaze up to the pine and I was blown away. There what couldn't have been more than a hundred feet away from the top of the pine was a bright red light. At first, I thought it was a rescue helicopter, maybe recovering someone from the top, but there was no sound. We had had rescue helicopters land before in the field we were standing in, and the way the bluffs and valleys work along the buffalo, sound travels extremely far. I also quickly ruled out the rescue helicopter because there were no campers as it was the weekend. The only ones with access to the antenna pine trail are the Boy Scouts, and any time someone goes missing or gets rescued off the camp's property, the camp director is immediately notified. This never happened. This object orbited above the pine slowly. I was unable to accurately judge the speed, but it was too slow to be a plane. So we sat watching this object for about seven minutes. It would occasionally speed up or slow down, very gradually, and it wasn't super noticeable. Someone in the group with us then said he was going to go wake all the other staffers up to see and bolted up the hill behind us. Almost immediately after my buddy had got to get more onlookers, the object stopped dead in its tracks about halfway through its orbit of the pine. During this stop, you can make out the cylindrical shape of the object shortly before it darts off almost instantly, completely disappearing from sight. We sat there for another 20 minutes and recounted our story to the few stappers that woke up and believed our buddy. Over these 20 minutes, the fireflies one by one went back to normal and we all eventually went to bed. I remember being somewhat confused because the last inexplicable thing I witnessed had left me horrified not even a week before. And this, there was no dread, fear, weariness or angst over it. Simply a feeling of wonder and bewilderment. I just hope whatever enjoyed the view of the buffalo as much as we had been. The next two stories are my brothers from the same camp. And the last is my most recent involving the fraternity house I live in. Two summers after my spooky experiences there, my little brother decided he too wanted to spend the summer out there. I was fully supportive of this and was excited for him to go. I gave him the normal, it's haunted over there you, which he shrugged off wasn't quite sure about the paranormal and had never seen anything. However, my parents had told him about this chat with my grandparents after they died, when he was a small child recently, so I think it had the gears in his head turning. During his first summer there, he was given the task of guiding our troop on the hike to Antenna Pine. They left late afternoon and reached the top about an hour and a half before sunset. They hung at the top for about 30 minutes, admiring the view and then left. On the way down, the troop's scoutmaster led the way, and my little brother stayed at the end of the group to make sure no kids got lost, and he would for sure be the last one across. He said that as they continued down the mountain, he got the feeling he was being watched, but chalked it up to the people he was chaperoning. As he continued, this feeling stuck, and he started to hear footsteps almost matching his. But when he stopped and looked back, the footsteps would stop and there was nothing there. Although this creeped him out, he said nothing and kept moving. I think he made the group move a little faster, reasoning it was about to get dark. They continued back to camp and my brother said he felt and heard this phenomenon the whole way. 
And while it was almost entirely muted footsteps on the rock trail he heard behind him, he heard twigs crack a couple times. He said this scared him the most. They continued down the ridge and finally reached the ford in the river. My brother said that there was the feeling was almost unbearable, and he looked into the woods behind him and saw nothing. Still feeling watched, he slowly took off his shoes and began to ford. He got about halfway across and said he was compelled to stop and look back. He said that as he did, a large splash of water rose up at the edge of the river, like someone had just taken their first step in crossing. My little brother stood paralysed before members of our troop calling his name snapped him out of it and he ran back across. This was summer 17. The following summer, he and a friend decided to go across the river to a cabin. This cabin was an original homestead cabin from Boxley Valley and has been reassembled here at the top of a small waterfall in the 90s to act as a living history exhibit for the camp. They did metalworking and several other pioneer crafts. The cabin had been abandoned since about 1998. I had heard stories of staffers in this cabin being subject to strange paranormal events and one of the staffers who had worked in the cabin had a son working with us. Crazy stories no doubt. Windows and doors slamming, crosses flipping upside down on the wall, pretty standard ghost story fare. I myself had been there several times, never noticing anything weird, just noting how cool the history behind the thing was. So my little brother and his friend made it to this cabin, and it being a relatively hot day, they sat their lawn chairs in the creek that feeds the waterfall. On the way up to this cabin, his friend had asked him multiple times if he heard laughing. While on the way he hadn't, as he sat there, he said he caught it in earshot from multiple directions the whole time they sat there. However, he never heard it clearly. As they sat there talking, a lull in the conversation left them looking at the area around them. My brother said in this moment, he noticed for a split second the only thing he could hear was the creek they were sitting in. And even then, he noted it sounded almost muffled. As he realised this, the most blood-curdling, bloody murder, loudest scream he had ever heard rang out. He said it lasted for a good three or four seconds and then stopped, but echoed loudly off the walls of the waterfall below. He and his friend were both terrified. His friend literally fell out of his chair into the creek and slowly stood up and approached the edge of the waterfall where they had heard the scream come from and peered down, only to see nothing 30 feet below them. No rustling from an animal or person running, simply nothing. This was the last time my bro little brother went across the river, and the next summer, he worked at a different camp altogether. The last experience I have to recount is recent, and multiple variations of it have happened over the past three and a half years. I live in a fraternity house that was built in 1920. It was constructed as the first female housing on our campus, and had seen a couple of owners before our fraternity, purchased it in 1971. When I moved in the fall of 2018, all the members told me the house was haunted, that Jake would sometimes make himself known. I was of course somewhat sceptical, as I thought it was just the older brothers who gave me a spook. The first time I knew Jake existed happened about three months after I moved in. Our entire chapter left the house at about 1am for activities. I ran upstairs and they left to put running shoes on and catch up with them. I sat on my couch and began tying my shoes quickly, when a large stomp outside my door scared the shit out of me, followed by footsteps moving away from my door. I stood up and opened the door expecting to yell at screw you at one of my brothers. However, upon opening the door I saw nothing, just heard footsteps moving away from down the hallway. I knew someone was there but I couldn't see a damn thing. The footsteps completely stopped at the wall at the end of the hall and I just stepped back in my room, locked the door and went to bed. I asked my frat brothers the next morning and they all asked me where I'd been. I told them what happened and that I thought one of them must have pranked me and they all told me I was the only one here. At first I didn't believe them but I'd literally watched every single one of them leave. The house also has the original hardwood floors throughout which are by no means quiet. You can hear just about anyone going anywhere in this house, so I would have heard doors open, the stairs creaking, etc. When I was in high school, I worked at a Boy Scout camp on the Buffalo National River. It was a summer camp slash high adventure outpost, and I spent two summers working there. 
The summers are 14 and a month in the summer of 15. When I started working there, older staff members started telling me stories of how haunted the camp and the trials it gave access to across the Buffalo River were. Things like children laughing in the distance, blood-curdling screams coming from deep in the woods, a haunted cabin across the river, and a slew of other, for lack of a better term, campfire stories. I, being totally sceptical of all of this, brushed it off and nearly the entirety of the first summer saw or heard nothing out of the ordinary. The only odd thing I saw the whole summer was lightning bugs, one by one turning red near the mouth of the trail, leading to the river until all the lightning bugs you could see in that direction were flashing a sort of sickly red colour. This is something that multiple people I worked with had told me had happened, and it didn't really scare me. It was more of a feeling of bewilderment and curiosity, but once again, I thought little of it. Before I get into the experiences I had the next summer, I think giving a brief overview of how the camp was laid out would be helpful. As I said before, the camp sat on one side of the river, with a large empty field running along the camp side of the river, used for various activities beyond this field. The land rose up in hills and bluffs, and trails led up the hill, to the centre of a camp, where the mess hall and trading posts were located, as well as the camp office and trails led up and down from this centralised location to the campsites, spread in every direction from the mess hall. Across the river, from the trail leading down from the field, you could ford the river and cross to multiple hiking trails, and led up to the camp's penultimate hike, Antenna Pine, which three and a half miles up rested atop a ridge, and the namesake pine could be seen from the camp itself. The first experience that was truly strange at the camp was the second weekend I had been there in the summer of 15, a friend of mine that I worked there with, who we'll call M, had told me stories of a moonshiner who used to work near the camp. He told me that a still was out there and wanted to go find it. Given it was our day off and a beautiful summer day, I jumped on the opportunity to hike. We headed out of camp, crossed the river and carried on up the trail. We ran across a group of the High Adventure staff and asked one of them we knew fairly well if he had heard of a still in the surrounding area. He immediately answered yes and pointed directly off the trail to our right, telling us that we would run into a creek in the woods out that way, and to follow it away from the camp until we came on a rock outcromping the creek ran over. Having the directions we needed, we stepped off the trail about half a mile from the river, and within about a minute, we found the aforementioned creek. We turned up to the creek and followed it away from the river for about 20 minutes, until we saw it. A rock bluff no more than five feet high, with about a 20 foot opening. However, the entirety of the mouth of the bluff had a handmade rock wall built into it, with a small door about four foot high in height in it, and a small window slash vent for the still about eight inches by eight inches. We were blown away. I can remember it being one of the coolest things I've ever found in the woods, and after we both crawled inside, we found it empty, with the exception of some thin copper tubing and a couple of mash pans that were deteriorated greatly. We hung around for another five minutes or so, investigating the place and noticed trails leading off in the opposite direction we had come in. Not well made trails, but more like the type created by deer. I noted this, then and my friend seemed convinced they were moonshiner trails. We wanted to follow them and see where they led. Rolling my eyes again to his suggestion of them being hooch runner trails, I followed him. Not having an issue with getting more chances to see nature and enjoy the day I followed along, looking to the left and right of me as I went taking in the view. We followed these trails uphill that ran alongside the same creek for probably about a quarter mile before M turned to me and said, hey, let's go back to camp. I don't feel so good. I thought nothing of this and turned around. We walked back the way we came for probably about 10 minutes and I noticed M was sweating more than he had been before. He just told me the sun must be getting to him and kept walking. I had him drink some water and he seemed normal, albeit quieter than usual. We carried on and my worry faded as he was walking and breathing normally. As we walked, I continued to look around and at some point zoned out staring at M's backpack. I eventually ran into the back of M's backpack and was snapped out of my thoughts. I pushed his backpack forward and told him to get moving. No response. I shook his shoulders and asked if he was okay. All he replied was, look, and raised his finger pointing directly ahead of us. Ahead, 
was a still we'd been in not even half an hour beforehand. And immediately to the right of the door was without a doubt the most blood chilling thing I'd ever seen. As soon as I laid eyes on it, I was hit with the most real sense of dread and fear I've had in my whole life. It was as if I knew I wasn't supposed to be seeing it and I was paralyzed, frozen still. A black shape stood about seven foot tall motionless, albeit its composition appeared to have some sort of movement within it. It struck me as a shadow at first and I immediately looked up to see if there was anything that could be casting it. Nothing, just the forest. I looked back quickly and looked at the object for another five seconds or so before it started moving. It moved itself directly centre on the doorway. It compressed down to the height of the doorway and rushed in. I thought that it was just a shadow, but when it moved, I could see there was dimensionality to it. And after looking at it for a few seconds, I could make out what seemed to be thick black smoke within this shape and filling it. It seemingly disappeared as soon as it entered the still. And before I could say a word, M was sprinting back towards the main trail and camp. I rapidly followed him, and neither of us stopped until we reached the river crossing and could see other staff across the river. As we sat there catching our breath, neither said a word. I sat listening and turned towards the woods we had just come out of, half expecting to hear or see something, crashing through the woods behind. It was silent. All I could hear was my own breathing and the sound of the river feet behind me. No birds, no squirrels, no human voices, despite staff and even outsiders using the trails frequently on the weekends. As I was taking my shoes off to the ford, the river again, M asked me, what the fuck was that thing? I simply responded with a shrug, not having the nerve to break the silence all around me. I was still hyper aware of how quiet it was while we were crossing and was almost slammed by the noise I experienced when we finally hit the other side. Birds were chirping all over, the wind was making the leaves on the trees rustle, and the voices of our fellow staff members carried through the field normally. M never said anything about the sound, but I honestly think he was so shaken he hadn't noticed. I took him to the camp chaplain, who offered to counsel me on what had happened as well, but I didn't want to talk about it. The one time I asked M later about it, he said out of nowhere he had gotten this feeling telling him he needed to leave now. Something primal feeling almost, he said. He didn't say anything to me because he thought it was strange too, but it decided he wanted to leave. I still don't know what I saw that day, but it scared the shit out of me. I had more creepy stuff happen the next week there, and my little brother worked there for two summers as well, and had some strange stuff happen. Four years ago, my uncle passed away. He was only 60 and had the kindest soul. He would call me all the time and tell me how he wanted to take me to the casino when I was old enough. Unfortunately, he never got the chance, as at the time of passing I was 20. The beginning of January is my birthday. On the 10th of December of 2016, my family and myself laid him to rest. We were all pretty sad about it, but in good spirits. We laid him to rest with all of his favourites. Whiskey, some sweets and an entire pack of cards. We placed him in his hand, a full ace, and said our final goodbyes. At the time, I lived in South Philadelphia for school. The morning after, I was expecting an Amazon delivery of Christmas presents for my girlfriend at the time. So I went into the kitchen to wait for the package that was supposed to be delivered soon. Taking a look out the window, I noticed the weather. I remember it vividly being a wet, rainy morning. Fog was in the air, and you could see maybe 20 feet in front of you. Definitely an odd vibe given the time of the year. Decided to take a quick look at my step. The package wasn't delivered yet, but I looked down and saw this small wooden box sitting on my doorstep. I had no idea what it was, so I took it inside to sit on the kitchen table to get a look. I open it up and see the box. I was absolutely speechless. I looked it over, around the house to make sure that nobody was playing a weird joke on me. I then noticed that both sets of cards were gone. This could either be an odd coincidence or something else at play. The reason why it's so odd is because I have absolutely no idea why someone would be walking around with this in South Philly and out of all people, leave it on my step. All of my roommates were gone for the day, so it had to have happened after they left. Also, in South Philly, 
You can't really leave stuff on your step or porch unless you want to get rid of it. I told all, all of my family about it, and they were just as weirded out as I was. I took the set back to my grandparents' house, where he lived at the time that he died. As soon as I set it down on the table, it all of a sudden looked not as pristine. It could have been the light, but as soon as I went to move it for dinner, it fell apart in my hands. Like the glue from the box all of a sudden dried up in my hands and no longer became of use. I don't know whether or not this counts as a ghost story, or if this even counts as an encounter, but it definitely was one of the weirdest experiences I've ever encountered. Nothing like that has ever coincidentally lined up in my life like that. Both of these stories took place seven or eight years ago, but I still remember them vividly. They both took place at my grandma's house, which always creeped me, my siblings and cousins out when we were younger. My parents have told me they even found the house creepy, like someone was watching them, that didn't want to scare us kids. Both events aren't that big, but I figured I'd share anyway. One night, me and my cousins were up late at night playing video games, probably 2 or 3 am. Of course we got hungry and wanted to make some pizza rolls, so we sneaked by our grandmother's room, she didn't like us being up so late and now we decide who's going to go downstairs first. To paint the scene, it's pitch black, like you can't see your hand two inches from your face black, and we're all a little scared, so my cousins force me to go down the stairs first. Since it's so dark, I'm slowly going down as I don't want to fall down. I also couldn't tell when I reached the bottom, because the stairs and floor were both made of the same wood. So when I reached the bottom, I took a few more cautious steps forward just to make sure. That's when I bumped into something taller than me that felt like when you run into a person taller than you. It completely stopped me in my tracks. I looked up and saw this figure right in front of me move to the left. Remember, it's pitch black. And at the same time, one of my cousins turned on the light. And there I was, standing in the middle of the living room with nothing around me. They of course saw nothing and I found it more creepy that something was probably just watching us walk down the stairs. The second story takes place in a very sim similar scenario, except I'm only with one of my cousins this time. We sneak downstairs to grab a bite to eat around 2 or 3 a.m. He's eating some cereal and we're chilling at the dining room table sitting across from each other. I'm talking while he's mainly focused on eating. Then there's this very loud growl next to my left ear which freezes both of us. I look at him and slowly say, Dude, did you hear that shit? And he nods. Then we both started laughing, probably because we didn't know what else to do. The race to get upstairs once the lights were out was full of panic. I occasionally bring up the second story with the cousin who was there, and he still remembers exactly like I do, so I know I'm not imagining it. My dad was bought an old house. It's a homestead from the 1840s in rural Nova Scotia. It's been a ski resort, a bed and breakfast, a farm, an artist retreat, and had a woodmill on the property until the 1960s. It has a very long history, and many people in the community are familiar with the house and the lakefront property it sits on. Locals have told us how much the place meant to them, and told us stories about the owner of the house between 1971 and 2004. This guy was properly loved in the community and used to let community children swim in the lake. The house isn't on the lake, the house sits on a steep hill over the lake. It's about 200 feet in elevation change and 300 feet between the lake and the house. One winter, a brother and sister wanted to play on the ice and asked the owner of the property if they could. The owner said no, but they were welcome to walk down to the shore of the lake. The sister was fine enough with this answer but the brother decided he wanted to do what he had done a month ago when the ice was thicker. He decided he would toboggan down the entire hill, onto the gravel and then onto the ice, a popular stunt many kids have done before, but never in late February slash early March. With his sister begging him not to, he slid down the hill, across the gravel and onto the ice. The ice along the shore was strong enough to hold his weight, but he slid further and further until he slowed over thin enough ice to break from underneath him. Firefighters failed to find him for hours, until he was found, by the shore, under the ice. It's unknown if he was trying to swim to shore while trapped under the ice, or floated that way. Shortly after my dad moved, 
I was in one of the guest rooms that overlooked the lake. It was a June evening, and the world was filled with the sounds of small frogs trying to fuck. I was admiring the view from the window when I saw light over the lake. The sun had been down for maybe five or ten minutes. Only orange and blue haze was left around the horizon. As I looked over the lake, I saw a small light moving quickly around the lake. I assumed it was a reflection of some sort, but it caught my eye enough to watch. It was darting to seemingly random points, quickly stopping and continuing again in a new direction. I thought it may have been a bird or a group of moths. It was dark. All I knew was that what I saw was strange, and I remembered it. This was long before I knew what happened on the lake. A couple of months later, and I'm back at my dad's house with some family. And over drinks, the topic of witnessing paranormal activity came up. People shared stories, and eventually, I talked about the light on the lake. My dad's significant other begins grilling me with questions about how the light moved and so on, and she claims to have seen these lights as well. My dad would see the light on the lake a few weeks after. A close cousin sees it a few weeks after that. We would go into the shared theories about the light that darts across the ice for a while. A couple of months ago, by and my dad is at the neighbor's house. The neighbor also lives on the lake. They were telling my dad about all the stories about the lake, pretty much a detailed account of everything that took place at that lake in the past 40 years. And eventually, the story about the kid who drowned came up. As the husband finished telling my dad about the story, the wife said something to the effect of, me and my mom have been seeing a light over the lake occasionally since that day. They then had a long conversation about witnessing paranormal activity. That friend of mine has a fellow student who comes from an old noble family in North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany. That owns a rather large and old estate built a few generations ago, where the family lived ever since. He moved to his university city a few hundred kilometers away and only stays at the family house over the holidays and a couple of nights a year. One of those times, his parents left for a weekend and he was the only one home and spent the evening in the living room watching TV. The living room was the heart of the estate with an open fireplace and posh furniture. He was sitting in an old armchair he knew was older than himself, and maybe even his parents. The armchair stood freely in the room facing the TV, so that the closed living room's door were in his back. As you might have imagined, we now come to the ghost part of the story, as he heard clearly audible footsteps coming from the parquet floor in the lobby downstairs. He turned the TV off and tried listening closely when he heard them again. He knew he was the only one home and thought of intruders and whatnot. Maybe someone saw his parents leave and wasn't assuming anyone to be home, since he had moved out a couple of years ago. He got up, went downstairs, turned all the lights on, checked the locked front door, and searched the kitchen and the downstairs bathroom. No sign of intrusion, nor any more steps. Relieved, he made his way back to the living room and continued watching TV. After some time, the footsteps left his mind. After all, it was an old house and he wasn't used to its noises anymore. Then, after some time, he felt what he described as a chilliness suddenly filling the room, as if brought by a light breeze. Once he noticed it, he was sure it hadn't been there before. Then the footsteps reappeared, but this time right behind him, between the door and the back of the armchair, sounding as if it was approaching him. He turned around hastily, only to find an empty room. The footsteps had disappeared and took the chilliness with them. Nothing more happened that night, but the eerie feeling remained. It wasn't ghosts per se he was afraid of, but he couldn't explain what he had experienced. The next morning, he tried to casually mention this weird experience to his father on the phone. His father wasn't surprised or incredulous, quite the contrary. He told him to call the priest, and as it was probably just his grandfather wanting to sit in his armchair and wasn't able to because it was occupied. Apparently, his father is used to calling the priest every now and then to speak a blessing and put souls to rest, and they experience steps, noises or chilliness a couple of times a year that stop after the priest has visited. They'd been doing this even while he was still living at home, and never told him to not scare him. His father apologised for not thinking about that before leaving for the weekend, but nothing had happened over the last ten or so months and he simply forgot, and he was so used to that casual haunting.
My brother and I have different dads. Unfortunately, his dad passed away a year prior to when the story is set. My mum and his dad did not go well together. He wasn't a bad guy, just troubled and really didn't know how to be a good partner. My mum said that after they separated and she met my dad and got pregnant with me, my brother's dad said, you finally got the girl you always wanted. This was something she had told him when they were together, that she always wanted a daughter, but obviously they didn't stay together to have another kid. When I was little, he was always really sweet to me. Not in a creepy way, just always interested in asking how I am. My mom said she felt like he always felt drawn to me, maybe because he regretted the end of his relationship with her, and I in some way made him think of what could have been. Who knows? Okay, so moving on to the story. A few weeks after my brother's dad died, I had a dream that I was in a hallway with him. He told me he was okay, and that he wanted to show me something. He grabbed a door handle, opened the door, and the brightest light came through, but then I woke up. I wish I could remember what he showed me, or if he did show me anything at all. Okay, now fast forward in time. It was Christmas Eve 2009, a year later. I was upstairs in my bedroom, and I heard music playing. We had a room next to mine with all kinds of toys, because I had a lot of nieces and nephews that came over. I assumed the music was coming from there, so I walked into the room to check. It wasn't coming from that room, and I realised it was coming from the bathroom. Uh, the bathroom? Odd, I thought. I went in there and realised the music was coming from a three-tier box, each tier with a drawer where my mom kept jewellery and other keepsakes. As soon as I touched the box, the music abruptly stopped. I was 21 at this time, and in all the years of living with my parents, I'd never heard music coming from this box, and she's had it my entire life. I go downstairs and tell mom the weirdest thing just happened, and I tell her the story. Her face goes completely white. She looks totally freaked out and her eyes well up with tears. She then tells me that it's a jewellery box that her ex-husband, my brother's dad who died, gave her on their wedding day. She said she hasn't played music in 35 years because it broke. We even went upstairs to try to recreate the music and get it to work with no luck. I just smiled and shrugged and said, well, I guess he's saying Merry Christmas. I don't know why he chooses me to go through with these messages. We weren't close but I do think part of it is that he knows I won't brush things off as my brain or something weird. I feel they're from him and he knows I'll share the message. My brother pretty much hasn't been very receptive to the messages and I don't want to make him uncomfortable or upset him. Many years ago when I was in college, I lived with my brother off and on. The house had a downstairs with the living room, dining room, kitchen and master bedroom and an upstairs with the kids room on one side, the bathroom on the other and a bit of space in between in front of the stairs. It wasn't really big enough to be called a room but it wasn't exactly a hallway. They set up a futon for me and that became my area. I remember thinking that the upstairs felt a little off, especially my niece's room. After a few months I started sleeping on the couch downstairs, partly because the kids would disturb me in the morning but also because I never felt right up there. There were several strange things that happened while I lived there. One night, my brother, sister-in-law, niece, nephew and I were at the table eating dinner. From upstairs, we heard one of my niece's talking dolls say something like, I want to play with you. It sounds like horror movie cliche bullshit, I know, but it was extremely unsettling when it happened in real life. No one else was in the house and they didn't have any pets. Another time, my niece was coming down the stairs when she fell suddenly. I remember thinking it was really strange because it didn't look like she tripped. It was more like she had been pushed. Her necklace had broken during a fall, but not at the clasp. The string had just broken like someone yanked it off. Then one night while I was still sleeping upstairs, I woke up and felt really uneasy. I think it was around 2 or 3 in the morning. Since the kids' room were across from the bathroom, they had to walk through my area to get from one to the other. I opened my eyes and saw what looked like someone in a pink bathrobe go into the bathroom. I didn't recall my niece having a pink bathrobe, so I thought it was kind of strange. After a while, when no lights had switched on and I didn't hear the sink or the toilet flushing, I started to get up to see if anyone was in there, but I got this really bad feeling that I should just leave it alone. In the morning, I asked my niece if she had a pink bathrobe, and I asked both my niece and nephew if either of them had gone to the bathroom in the middle of the night. They both said no. 
Sometime later, I mentioned the whole thing to my sister-in-law. She asked me if my brother had told me to say that. I was confused and said, no, why? She told me that when they had first moved in, she kept having this dream that there was a lady in a pink bathrobe sitting in the living room. They kept telling her to leave, but she wouldn't. Then one night, she dreamed that the lady was in the doorway of her room, screaming, and then flew at her and started choking her. A while after all this happened, my sister-in-law went around the house saying, Okay, lady, I know you're here. Then she had the dream of moving in again, and this time they put the boxes all around her instead of telling her to leave. I moved out shortly after, but the incidents mostly stopped after that as far as I know. My sister-in-law said they just had to learn to live with her. So someone talked about the Telfair mansion. I'll call it a mansion, museum and a house, and Mary Telfair herself. And as I've come to find out, she might hate me. I've tried to go in there to look around, you know, the museum collection a few times, and I step in and it immediately feels like either A, someone is screaming into both of my ears, and or B, someone is pounding a brick against my skull. So I just don't go near there too often if I can help it, especially not at night. On the same token, the building is beautiful. Absolutely amazing. Unconfirmed, but I'm pretty sure that when she was basically the last of her family line, her wealth rivaled that of the Rockefeller and Vanderbilt. Like, filthy rich, you know? And there's a lot of superstition surrounding her will. Allegedly, in her will, she had demanded that female actors never be allowed near the home. And some other things I don't need to get into. You can read her will on their website, Telfair's Will. Anyway, on to my experience. So back in early September, I was about to leave Savannah for a bit and decided to drive the tour one more time late at night with my then girlfriend. So we're driving around and get to Telfair Square where we both get really quiet. We both feel like something is up but neither of us says anything. So I pull over in the square adjacent to the mansion and start just looking around, trying to get the jovial mood back. She's on a phone when I look over to the museum. That's when I see it. A woman is standing next to the building, arms crossed, glaring at me. I'm used to getting odd glances, but she was shooting daggers through my skull. Metaphorically, thankfully. And I, looking back, was staring right through her. Literally. She was opaque. And standing behind her is a shadow. Tall and only identifiable between the literal darkness. And it's the purple-like outline that kept flowing around it. Like liquid darkness. Red eyes slanted in like some demonic entity pulled out of a movie. The moment this happens, my girlfriend, looking up from her phone, just says, Drive, in the super concerned voice. So I do, because I don't want to stick around. I peel out of the square and it feels like we're being chased. She couldn't see anything, but it felt like we were surrounded by an inexorable darkness, trying to close in on all sides. And the red eyes blinking in and out of my rear view. Best idea was to not stop. That's when she starts spilling out directions. Simple, turn here, next right, go. Simple stuff, but all super concerned and rhythmic like a GPS without a destination. Just an escape route. We travel halfway across the city before the feeling begins to fade, and we both start panting as if we've been running for our lives. There's no safe feeling between us. We're scared. We find a safe, well-lit spot and we debrief. So I say what I saw, and she just said she suddenly didn't feel safe, so somewhat on the same page. Neither of us knows what happened, and this wasn't the first time she's felt that way and told me to drive. This was the first time, however, where I saw everything. I don't know what happened, or what I did to upset anyone near that house, but I still make a point to never travel around the city, especially near Telfair Square, alone. So I do ghost tours in Savannah, Georgia. A great start already. I love paranormal stuff. Ghosts, demons, angels, etc. And ever since I've started working here, I've yet to have a tour where something weird hasn't happened. So I have a lot of experiences around this. This one though, was my very first. So a few months back in August, when I first started walking there, we gave tours through some homes. I'm contractually bound to not say where, sorry. But basically, super famous homes, and on the second floor of this house, there's a nursery. Now, 
A nursery is already super creepy, with period dolls and furniture and scares most people, including myself. I'm not scared of the dolls, yet, but I am kind of scared of the kid that lives there. Oddly enough, there's no evidence or news that a child ever died in this home, but I was told about him by my former co-workers. Three people have told me they've caught him on camera on my tour, and one person last week put a name to him. He's a young lad, about eight years old, in a late 1800s nightgown, and a bowl cut. He's a devious bugger, and has been known to turn on people's phone flashes and ringers as well, to scare many young kids whose parents do not believe their kid when they say stuff like, Mommy, can you tell him I don't want to play with him? And stuff like that. So in August, there was a three-day stint where he would be caught in the room in different spots. The second night, my friend was on the tour and sent me the picture he caught of the kid in the back, peeking over a crib. This isn't what bothered me. What really messed with my head is what happened the following week. The house got a different feel to it. No one liked to be there for too long and everyone, including myself and my co-workers, noticed it seemed much colder than normal. Note, we contractually cannot touch or alter anything in the house without receiving a massive penalty, fine, and being fired. Which includes the thermostat, obviously. Well, as we all braced ourselves through the week, I got caught up in something I really wish I hadn't. As we were moving people to a different room and I was waiting to get the next group into the house, I remembered that my manager had gone to the basement to use the private restroom, and I wanted to make sure that they turned off the downstairs light. So I make my way over the nook and open the door. There's a woman standing at the bottom of the steps. In the quickest instant, I noticed she had flowing brown hair and was dressed in a very formal, very 1800s hoop skirt dress. That was just in a split second, because before my brain could process a response or a greeting, she looked up the stairs at me and her eyes were glowing green, like flashlights through the dark downstairs area. She glared right through me and started running up the stairs. I say running, but more so like flying, charging right up the stairs. I slam the door and buck out of the house, call my manager to notify him and take a needed break. Once shift was over without another hitch, I got to asking around and four separate people told me that I had seen Mary. Again, can't give the full name, sorry. As fate would have it, Mary died in that home and had quite a few children, not all of whom are fully documented for. They proceeded to explain that since infant mortality was so high, it's very possible many kids went unaccounted for, thus leading to a possible explanation for the kid upstairs. My major issue then is, why did she come after me? Day and night, Mount Hope Cemetery is always unsettling. Every time I pass by it, I always feel like I'm being watched. Most of the time it's an easy feeling to brush off, but there are three instances where I've been shaken to the core. The first. I was in fourth grade. My whole class went on a field trip to the cemetery. From the very beginning when I, it was brought up, I expressed my lack of interest in going, but I was the only one not showing enthusiasm, so I knew then it was going to happen. I dreaded it hoping that my teacher would decide to cancel the trip. I wasn't allowed to skip school as a kid, so I never even asked. I went to the cemetery with my class. They were all having a wonderful time. I was immersed in vibes that were making me sick to my stomach. We were told to make rubbings on paper with a crayon of at least three gravestones that caught our eye. I didn't want to, but I did anyway. While I'm rubbing these gravestones, I felt like I was stepping on the toes of someone and that I was bothering someone. I managed to rub too. The third I picked, my crayon was still in my left hand. I grabbed a piece of paper from the pile near me. When I knelt down to begin rubbing it, I had an overwhelming feeling of anger wash over me. I stopped dead. For a second, I couldn't move. This gravestone didn't want to be rubbed. I tried to tell the reason to myself. It's a 117 year old rotted corpse. It can't possibly be anything. To no avail, I could have forced myself to rub this one. I decided that wasn't best. I didn't rub a third one. I couldn't get myself to do it. It freaked me out. I said it out loud to no one in particular. There's something wrong with this grave. It doesn't... I stopped talking. I wasn't really comfortable talking about the experience to anyone around me. I knew they wouldn't have believed me anyway. I know what I felt and it wasn't peaceful. If I rubbed that grave, someone or something would have attached to me 
and it would have been nearly impossible to shake off. The second, it was in summer of 2012. I biked home from work. I worked at Wendy's and lived in Vizzi. The cemetery was on my right. I looked because I saw someone. I thought it was a dumb teenager doing something stupid. It wasn't. I saw two shadows watching me, one looming over a grave. It had long, creepy fingers and a thick, dark, malevolent energy that seemed so bent on anger and misery. It must have been an entity of pure evil. The other was a man, a shadow standing right next to it. It was akimbo to a thick tree. His top hat brim remained straight, even as close as he was to the tree would have bent the brim. He must have been seven feet tall. The looming one lunged toward me. Fuck, I yelled, completely unsure I was about to get possessed. The akimbo one flinched, and they were both gone. I was still myself and relieved, heart pounding, but I was okay. The third. I was biking home again, through Mount Hope Avenue. I almost got through the cemetery without seeing anything, then suddenly, two lights caught my attention. They were moving crazy fast. One was chasing the other. They crossed the road in front of me, the one lagging behind suddenly pounced. They let go. They both darted past the road and on the other side. The moment they began getting smaller, they were gone. Conclusion. Of course, there are times when I can't avoid going past Mount Hope Cemetery. I sense other spirits and the like. I just completely downright refuse to acknowledge them. There's definitely something sinister about the cemetery, and part of me feels like there might be something that wants to latch onto me. This was a dream that was very vivid and very real. A month later, and it's still disturbing to me. On an evening a few days before Thanksgiving 2019, my wife and I went to bed fairly early in hopes to get some much needed sleep before our one month old son wakes up for a bottle. I fell asleep fairly quickly. I dreamt that I was in a dark grey night scene. It was a landscape similar to downtown Bangor, Maine, against the waterfront and surrounding land, but there were no cars parked on the street. There might have been a few stray cars, but for the most part, none parked anywhere. I'm apparently walking home, although I don't know how I got downtown. I was having difficulty finding the bridge to Brewer. In the eerie grey, everything looked way too much alike. I walked a bit and realised that it was the wrong way. So I circled around in place and chose another direction and walked a little then. Soon realising that I still wasn't in the right direction, I circled again and chose a direction and my scenery seemed to be making sense. I was relieved. It was a long walk home, but at least I was on my way. Just as quickly as I was relieved, I was nervous again. I was being followed. I looked around. I couldn't see anyone. Just as I began to relax, thinking it was nothing, a kid wearing black, with a grey mask over his face and a hoodie with the hood over his head, walked beside them in front of me, in a weird motion, like a curling walk. I stopped walking. He tilted mask head, one way, then the other. He lifted his right fist up, the index finger, the only finger not locked in a fist. He lifted his other hand in the same way and used index finger to purposely point at the index finger of his right. He killed backwards, a few steps, walked forward and disappeared somewhere behind me. Glad he was gone, I continued to try and find home. That's when I realised the bridge into Brewer didn't exist and that I was trapped in Bangor. I found myself disoriented in a parking lot. I couldn't figure out how or which one it was. I thought, maybe the wing lots where I park my car when I go to work, but I could see Hollywood slots, the casino in the close distance, so that didn't make sense. It was also weird. I noticed the parking lot I was in had a road going through it. Then it occurred to me that I was not in a parking lot, but smack bang in the middle of a road. It was like I was in a video game where the rest of the map hadn't been unlocked yet. This location inconsistency helped me realise it was a dream, and I was done with it. I told myself to wake up. It wasn't easy. As much as I tried to wake up, I couldn't. So I figured since now that I knew it was a dream, I could gradually wake myself up, as I should be in a lucid dream state. I continued to walk around. The boy in the mask appears. Just appears. No warning right in front of me. He has a pocket knife in his right hand. The short blade is exposed to the air. 
He signals the number one with his left index finger and then brings his hand closer to his chest and cuts his index finger with the blade. Beads of blood ooze out and fall into his sleeve shirt. He puts his bleeding finger to his masked mouth. Shh, I can hear faintly. Fed up, I try to wake myself up to no avail. I walk around again, saying to myself, this is a dream. I'm dreaming. Wake up. I'm dreaming of waking up. It wasn't long before the masked kid appeared again. I attempted to walk away from him. He wouldn't let me pass. So I decided to run away. He remained in front of me, refusing to let me through. We ended up face to face, circling each other. All the while, I'm trying to wake up and try to get away from this creepy kid. No matter what I do, I can't escape. As we circle each other, he cuts his index finger and then puts it to his mouth. When I hear the faint shh, he does it all over again. I'm done. This is fucked up. Wake up, Paul, I demand to myself. No luck. The masked kid disappeared again. Wake up, Paul, I demand to myself again. No luck. Maybe if I avoid acknowledging the presence of the masked kid when I see him again, I thought. I continue to walk around, hoping I just wake up. The masked kid appears again. I don't acknowledge I see him and just keep walking, all the while he remains directly in front of me. As much as I deny the fact that I don't see him, in actuality, I do and can't ignore him. He seems to thrive on the fact that I can't ignore him. He proceeds to cut his index finger as the blood rolls down his finger and into his sleeve. He puts the bloody finger to his masked lips. Shh. Again faintly, he mutters. I began to chant, I need to wake up, as we circle each other as before. He repeatedly cuts his finger and then puts it to his face. Shh, he mutters quietly. We repeated the cycle several times. Suddenly, in the background, I hear a baby's whimper. It sounded a lot like my son Matthew. I knew it was. I need to wake up, I yell. The masked kid puts his bloody finger to his mouth, shakes his head, no, and says, shh in the typical fashion. We continue to circle. I continually tell myself to wake up. Meanwhile, my baby whimpers are getting louder in the background and they're beginning to sound like a cry. As we continue to circle, my wife, Katie, nudges me. Paul, can you feed Matthew? I finally woke up. I'm lying in bed. I can see my bedroom. Yep, I reply sleepily. Then I'm dragged back to the dream, circling again. Matt needs me, I say to the kid. He shakes his head. No. Katie nudges me. Can you feed Matthew? Yep, I replied. I can see my bedroom again. I'm in bed. As I try to get out of bed, I find myself being pulled back into the dream. I resist with all that I can. I shook my head to wake up and force myself out of bed. I'm on my feet, in my bedroom. I touch the dresser next to me to make sure I am awake. I walk around our queen bed to pick up Matthew who's crying in his bassinet. I'm so relieved I'm awake. I take him to the kitchen to get a bottle, heat it up and give it to him in the living room. That was the most vivid dream I've ever had. I haven't been able to get it out of my mind since. It was more like a nightmare. I could smell, touch. Walking in those circles was tiring. Was this nightmare more than just a nightmare? I always hated the house on Pond Street, ever since the first moment I saw it from the outside. It gave off a creepy energy that left a knot in my heart. Inside, it was full of six foot mirrors. Every single room had something off about that I could never pinpoint accurately. The only room that gave me relief from this feeling was the bathroom in the downstairs efficiency apartment. I'd use it often. Every time I walked into the house through the back middle door, I'd feel someone watching me through the wall hanging a quilt. There was also a sense of annoyance and frustration emanating from that covered mirror as if the lurker's view was blocked. A few times at night, in my bedroom, I saw figures in the mirrors on the closet. There was a man wearing a top hat standing in the middle of the room. A tall guy rocked in a glider in the corner of the room right next to the closet mirrors. I didn't have a gliding rocker in my bedroom. The highlight of living at this house was having the pool, at least in the summer. Something lurked in and by the pool that wasn't happy. The pool was dreadful during the winter months. 
We moved to this house in the fall and couldn't play in the pool immediately. Since the first moment I noticed the pool, I could tell there was a strange, eerie energy hanging around the pool. The pool and the surrounding pool deck looked inviting and comfortable more than anything, but never exactly comfortable. From the very beginning, I felt there was a little boy with weird evil intentions. He didn't want to hurt anyone, but at the same time he wanted to hurt someone whenever he pleased. I dismissed the energy as electrical impulses from the pump and filter. I later realised I was wrong, very wrong. During the first summer, I was the only one in the pool. I swam to the bottom of the deep end, about 12 feet. I was on the other side of the pool where the floor filter was. I felt a slight tug on my leg. It felt like someone skimmed against it. It freaked me out, but I thought nothing of it. Thought it must have been some sort of debris. But my opinion changed during the winter. When the pool was closed up and covered with snow, I was drawn to it. There were several instances where I'd go outside to make a snowman or a fort, or sled down the hill on the side yard. I did these things, yes. But I'd also have to frequently check the pool. I would have to stand on the pool deck at the edge, overlooking where the deep end drops off. Just look. Sometimes I'd see the top of a little boy's head up and down beneath the ice. Sometimes, I'd be by the pool, and I'd have no recollection of opening the gate. Or walking into the area. One time, on a cold day in January, I found myself by the pool. Just as I realised I didn't remember getting there, I had a sudden urge to check the strength of the ice by standing on it. The conflicting voice of logic told me not to, and I didn't. At least I thought I hadn't. Next thing I knew, seconds later in a trance, I found myself stepping down onto the ice. All the while I'm thinking, this is how I'm going to die. I'm going to be 11 years old and I'm going to get trapped under the ice of my pool. I tried to resist, but I couldn't. My heart was pounding. As I'm standing on the ice, I managed to turn around. I tried to step up and back on the deck, but I'm paralysed. I'm terrified. I don't want to die, I thought. I heard an extremely faint, almost inaudible crack beneath the snow-covered ice as I plummeted into the icy water below. Instantly, after the, the trance lifted and I pulled myself out, I plummeted waist deep. I wasn't cold, but I felt shaken. I actually questioned if I had actually fallen in. Wet ski pants were a confirmation. I couldn't get the boy out of my head. As I went about my evening, the boy was on my mind. It was confusing. A chilling thought popped into my head. Is Pond Street named after a long gone pond? Did a boy drown in the pool? Is there a mirror world where a boy drowned in the pool? I recently bought a house that's about 70 or 80 years old. It's a small house that originally hand built by the first owner. There's no known bad history here and no bad vibes. But I have a two sets of motion lights that are on different sides of the house that like to periodically go off at the identical time in the middle of the night for no apparent reason. And I can see there is nothing happening outside. Two weeks or so ago, as I'm walking down my driveway, a random vehicle pulls up and the driver, who I've never seen before, tells me my house is haunted by a woman named Mina. He tells me that she likes to set off lights in the middle of the night, but she is friendly and not to be worried. He drives off and I've never seen him again since. Very weird interaction. But he was very friendly, so no harm, no foul. Hopefully explains the lights, I guess. Today I find myself with a rather sick stomach and spend longer than usual in my shower. I'm well aware, as I, was in not, as I wasn't in a rush at all, that my stereo in the room was completely off. I live alone and was homesick all day with the house locked. But I return to the bathroom later and my stereo is switched on. It sits on top of a six foot tall cabinet and has no way to be accidentally turned on. So I guess I'm now hoping these are all from this Mina I'm told about. And nothing more negative. I figured since I just got back from my third trip to Niagara Falls last week and caught something odd on camera, that I would begin with my first Niagara Falls experience. I was living in Cincinnati, Ohio, and on New Year's Eve of 2018, about to be 2019, 
The guy I'd just started dating asked what I wanted to do to celebrate. It was like 8 p.m. or so, and I told him I wanted to see a waterfall because I'd never seen one before. So me, being impulsive and spontaneous, said, hey, Niagara Falls is only seven hours away by car, and the park's open 24-7. Let's go. So we did. We arrived at Niagara Falls between 3 and 4 a.m. It was now January 1st, the middle of winter, so it was like 15 degrees. Windy, frozen snow still on the ground, pitch black outside. We just parked at the first parking spot we could find in town and followed the sound of the waterfall. To our surprise, we were literally the only two people in the entire state park. Like, yeah, it was the middle of the night in the middle of winter, but still, I thought surely there would be a few other people there, even just local teenagers. But no, just us. I didn't even see any security or cop cars the whole time I was there. It was creepy, but also so cool. Only about half the lamps were on along the paths and trails. They just alternated, one off, the next one on, the next one off, etc. I suppose to conserve power. I was also surprised that access to the river was just kind of wide open. No gates or anything unless you're actually at the designated overlook part of the falls. But head back along the river a few yards so you're technically behind the falls and there's no gates at all along that ru rushing river. I thought with it being a global suicide hotspot, they would either have more security or at least put up a gate along the river, making it less easy to just walk or slip on ice and glide right into it. But nonetheless, we were walking on the path along the river, away from the falls, where we were surrounded by darkness and trees, with the river on our right. We were laughing and having a great time. For anyone who's familiar with Niagara Falls, we were walking to Three Sisters Island and we were about halfway there on this barely lit path. The guy I was with had to pee, so we stayed back a little ways, peeing in the bushes. I was alone maybe 50 feet on the, ahead on the path, under one of the lamps that was on. Then all of a sudden, I can't explain it, but I felt this sensation of swooshing taking over my body and I was suddenly overcome with the most extreme sense of desperation and hysteria and adrenaline and being terrified, with this urge to just run and jump into the Niagara River, River next to me. I felt like I was having a mental breakdown and losing my mind. So depressed and suicidal and so, so desperate for it to end, I was thinking of all the people I loved, but not my loved ones, just anonymous loved ones, if that makes sense. And I felt so fucking sorry that I was leaving them behind. But the fear, adrenaline, desperation and hysteria is what I felt the most. It's like my mind was on fire with the hysteria and depression and it terrified me. And the desperation to make it end is what was triggering the adrenaline and urge to jump into the water. The worst mental and emotional pain you can imagine. Ugh, I just wish I could describe this better for you guys. But the word that comes to mind aside from hysterical is anguish. I felt the anguish. And that, combined with the hysteria and suicidal feelings and intense desperation, made my mind feel red hot. Like I had to jump into the river. That I was running from something terrifying in my own mind. I knew the only way out was to end it all. Like, just imagine running into something that is so petrifying and evil that you just become hysterical from the fear and become desperate to kill yourself just to get away from it. That's what I felt. It felt so intense that even after it ended, it still felt terrifying. Even though in reality, it only lasted about five or 10 seconds from the time the swoosh of emotions overtook me to when they finally ended. Then instead of my mind feeling red hot, my whole body suddenly felt ice cold, but still felt so much fear. After it ended, I was just frozen with fear till the light from the lamp above me made this big pop sound and suddenly went out. But when it did, it was like the bulb went out because the two lights next to it didn't turn on. As I said, the lights alternated, so if one went out, the next two to it that had been off would normally turn on, but that didn't happen. When the lights burst, I suddenly felt like I just had to run away. So I ran to the guy I was with and tried to explain what happened. I told him it felt like I was feeling the exact same emotions as fear as someone who had committed suicide there had felt the moment they did it. That's the only thing I could think of. I was feeling what someone else felt right before they jumped into the river to go over the falls and die. I have my fair share of paranormal spirit encounters, 
all of which I tried to debunk first and foremost. But that was the first and only ghost encounter I've ever had. Though instead of seeing the ghost, I simply felt the ghost. It definitely freaked me out, to say the least. Then around 6am, we drove back home. Eventually, I went with my mom to Niagara Falls the next year, and nothing would wild happened, as it was during the day. But then this weekend, I drove up to Niagara Falls for a third time, with my boyfriend, the same guy I was dating during the first trip, and his 12-year-old son. We got there during the day and stayed until nightfall so we could see the falls lit up before heading home. Because of my ghost encounter from our first trip, I tried to take a bunch of photos that night, with and without flash, especially in the area where the encounter happened. I always took more than one picture so I could compare it to others. Upon reviewing the pictures after I got home, I saw this strange one that had flying orbs, as I call them, floating down to the ground. The other photos I took of the same spot had no such orbs and there were no lights in the background that could have caused this. And keep in mind, I am not an orb person. I just did this out of curiosity, hoping to see an apparition or something. To top it off, I also reviewed the pics I took earlier in the day with my boyfriend and his son. And on four or five separate pictures, there appears to be a blue orb floating down the river further and further in each picture. Definitely strange, but like I said, I'm not an orb person. I've never believed in them really, and they could have been caused by the reflection of the water. The daytime orbs were totally different from the nighttime orbs. The daytime orbs were just blue balls of light that could easily be from a flare. But the nighttime orbs were mostly white and had tails between them that made it look they had almost been twirling in sync with one another. 